morning and welcome to the CRF webinar on navigating the future of jobs, work and careers. I'm Gillian Pillins, I'm Research Director at CRF and I'm joined today by um, Julia Howes from Mercer, Dave Milner, uh, Sarah Hamilton-Hanna and uh, Nick Shackleton-Jones. So the purpose of the webinar today we're going to be talking about the future of work um, and um, as, as those of you who have already participated in CRF webinars will know, we like to make this as interactive as we can. So we're going to be asking the audience to participate in some polls and we'd also love to hear your questions. So do fire them through and we will, uh, we will deal with as many of the audience questions as we can as, as we go through. So the topic of the future of work uh, is, is a huge uh, topic and we only have 45 minutes. So we're going we're to stay focused and uh, we're really going to home in on a couple of key topics. Um, one is thinking about demographic change and the impact that's likely to have uh, on organisations. We're going to be talking about the effects of uh, technology and automation on jobs and we're going to be discussing the talent and learning implications. So before we get into, uh, into the, um, the substance of the discussion, we'd like to get the views of the audience. And we're going to, um, just to start off, we'd like to get a sense of how you're feeling about uh, the impact of technology and automation on jobs. So are you essentially optimistic, essentially pessimistic or neutral? And if you can um, be responding to the poll while we get the conversation underway and we'll, um, we'll bring in the results in a minute. So we, when, we look at, when we think about the future of jobs, work and careers, we have to, um, to coin Donald Rum, to, to borrow a phrase from Donald Rumsfeld, we have a number of known unknowns and we have some unknown unknowns. So we thought maybe we could start with some of the known unknowns which is um, the, the impact of the ageing population and, and de demographic changes on, on the workforce. So Julia, you've done um, quite a lot of research on this at Mercer um, recently, so can you share, share, uh, share with us some of the key messages from that research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so actually this journey for us started in earnest about 18 months ago, uh, where we're actually looking at the workforce implications of Brexit. Um, and so we modelled out the workforce in the UK. We looked at various demographics um, in terms of the ageing, you know, different birth rates, um, participation rates, etc. And then we modelled different scenarios of migration. So that was the an original intention. And actually, what we concluded when we went through the work, it worked through all the modelling, um, is that actually Brexit or migration doesn't really matter. Um, so, so what we mean by that is that when you look at the implications of the ageing workforce on the UK and the implications on supply, it doesn't really matter what our net migration is, that, that, that implication is still going to be massive. Um, so to put some numbers behind it, we find that the population, so the number of people in the UK, will grow at a rate that's either 3 to 6% faster than the workforce. And under one or a couple of our scenarios of migration, the actual workforce in the UK could decline. So even though we'd have positive migration coming into the country, the population would, would um, the, the workforce would go down. Um, and to put that in context, that's the exact reverse of the last 15 years. So the last 15 years, we've actually seen a higher workforce growth than we have number of people. Um, so we wanted to look into this into more detail. And so we looked back historically and we found that there's been one, only one other time that the UK has had higher population growth than workforce growth uh, and that was in baby boomers. So that was when we had more babies <laughs> and that was causing it. Now when we look at it, this population growth that we're going to have that's higher than workforce growth is going to be because of an ageing population. So it's a dynamic that the UK has been talking about but not really faced ever. Um, so when we look and in, scratch into that, um, into that issue a little bit more, what we've found is that by 2030, there'll be 3 million more people over 65 in the UK. And if you look at the UK-born population, um, it actually has already started to decline. So it started to decline in 2013. And because of the known demographics, we know that that will continue to decline for the next 15 years. And from our perspective, I think that while automation and another topic we're going to cover today is a big kind of trend for organisations, we're not paying enough attention to the fact that we're going to have a massive shortage of labour um, and one that I think we're already seeing today. So if you look at current unemployment stats, current vacancy rates, uh, current active rates, we're already facing that. But if people think that that's going to go away in the next couple of years, then unfortunately they're, they're quite mistaken. OK. So we've just got the results mm. of the poll that have come in, and, and perhaps people's views will change based on mm -hmm. what you've just said, Julia. But um, we've got uh, 
72% who are essentially optimistic about the impact of technology and automation on jobs. Only 6% who are essentially pessimistic and uh, just under a quarter who are neutral. So we've got a really happy audience today, which is, which is great. Uh, Julia, the, the, you, talk, you talked about the, the UK, but I wonder, is that phenomenon likely to be the same in, in, in other parts of the world? Absolutely. So in the same way that we kind of concluded that the migration in the UK will will obviously have an impact but is not the underlying cause. When you look at this globally, we're seeing the same thing. And so interestingly, that dynamic of the population growing faster than the workforce will occur in most major economies in the world. And in fact, it will occur more in some of the younger economies that we typically to point to, you know, in terms of some of the Asian economies and China and things like that. And that's because the relative change that they're going to face in the next 15 years will be extreme. So this ageing population is a global dynamic. Uh, and so therefore, we, we won't find solutions in moving work to other, other countries. Right. OK. So what, what would you say are the main implications for organisations of uh, what you found in, in your research? So I think, I mean, there's some, there is some positive implications, which is the nice news. But I think the first thing is that organisations need to wake up to this issue. Um, I think actually when people hear about automation, sometimes they think that's going to solve the shortage problem. Um, I think that we are seeing some business leaders start to wake up to this and say, yes, actually it is getting more and more difficult for us to attract the talent or the skills that we need. Um, but I think sometimes they're, they're looking at old traditional mechanisms. So they tend to think about graduate training programs. And by graduate training programs, we're talking about young ones. So, so I think, I think the, the first step is to acknowledge the problem <laughs> and the issue. And then the second is to think differently about talent pools and the way that you can go out and attract different workers from different, different segments, older workers, women that have never worked before, et cetera, and really think about a, a very positive kind of diverse workforce that you can create, um, but it is thinking about about labour in a very different way. Mm, yeah, so we need to really shift our models in terms of thinking about the right sources of talent and and, and perhaps invest in in um, in upskilling parts of the population that we might never have have thought about tapping exactly. into before. I think the issue is so large that organisations will need to have a multi-tiered solution. And so I think part of it will be graduate programs for younger people, part of it will be upskilling, part of it will be automation, part of it will be productivity. And I, I think organisations will only be successful if they take that holistic view. Okay. So really we, we need to be looking at multifaceted solutions to, to this problem. Yeah. And um, so I guess what one one obvious uh, opportunity is is around uh, how we use technology and you know there is so much uh, in the press at the moment you know it's a big big topic the impact of uh, of automation and and ai and so on 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 jobs um, there are many different views out there there are the highly dystopian views that uh, there's a, a well-known paper from uh, written by Carl Frey at, at Oxford that says 47% of jobs are going to disappear as a result of, of automation. Um, some other commentators are a bit more nuanced about this, but um, clearly we can't avoid the impact of, of technology on, on the workforce. So before we, we get into discussing this in a bit more detail, um, we'd like to ag again um, uh, ask the audience about their thoughts. So if we can turn to, to the second poll, and um, ask you for, you know, for, for your perspective on um, which of the following best describes the impact that you expect artificial intelligence or automation to have on your workforce over the next three years. So is it going to be very limited or none? Does it mean some jobs will change but there's little impact on the overall size and profile of the workforce? Are you expecting many jobs to change with a requirement for substantial reskilling, recruitment or redeployment? Do you think your workforce is going to decrease as a result of AI or Perhaps, alternatively, it's going to increase as you hire new people into the business, or you just don't know. So there are quite, quite a number of options there, but um, if you can um, uh, be answering that poll as we, um, as we start to discuss this topic. So, Dave, um, to talk about uh, the impact of technology on jobs, you know, as, as I've said, there are many perspectives on, on what we might expect. But um, I wonder, uh, and, and I guess the simple answer is we don't know mm. what that's going to be. But I wonder if there, if there are, um, if, we, if we can learn from what we've seen so far, um, or perhaps if we can learn from the past in terms of what we might expect the impact to be. I think the only thing that's certain is the degree of uncertainty, is, yeah. as you've described. I think the, the, the challenge that we have 
is ensuring that we are at least expecting and making sense of what is going to happen or what we do know. So it's a little bit like what Julie was saying is we need to have a plan, basically, and the plan has to have many different elements. So I can bore you with all sorts of statistics. You know, we've got the sensationalism of headlines that are saying doom and gloom, all the jobs are disappearing. I, I believe that there is enough information and insight from reputable people such as the World Economic Forum, the OECD, so organisations that don't have a, should I say, a reason for projecting a particular view about certain things, that there is no doubt that automation is going to impact on jobs, okay? I believe, however, that automation is going to, without a doubt, replace processes and tasks that are within particular jobs. And I think it's therefore an opportunity to reconstruct jobs in a different way. I think there will be jobs that will disappear because maybe they can be fully automated. So that is concerning, but I, I think that provides opportunities for organisations and the individuals to maybe rethink what they want to do. Um, but, but I think this whole degree of automation is going to replace employees I don't see that. I, I think that there's a really good report written by the World Economic Forum. September 2018, it came out. It's called Future of Jobs. It's well worth having a look at because it gives what I think is a very balanced view about the fact that jobs will change, they'll be reconstructed. Skills, as you were saying, Julia, will also need to be reconsidered. But I don't necessarily think it's doom and gloom. You know, I, I look at I look at, it, you know, if you look out over London today, there are cars everywhere. And most of the cars of today are, are being constructed by robots. But knowing a number of organisations I've worked with, there are still people on the, on the lines who are putting the cars together and have different focuses on quality, excellence. Whereas in the old days, nobody wanted a car that was built on a Friday afternoon. You know, so I think... We need to think differently, we need to have a plan, and I think ultimately within the HR community, we need to be thinking very much from a future proofing of what do we need to do to change our practices, and what opportunities does that give to the HR function, and I think it's an exciting time for the function if we've got the sort of courage to um, challenge some of the some of the issues that are out there. Okay, so you so you would place yourself in, firmly in the 72% optimistic. Uh, with uh, all the people that are listening poll, yeah. today, absolutely. Exactly. Okay, so we, we've got the results of the second poll that, that's come through. And um, so opinions kind of pretty much divided around two main uh, conclusions. The first is just under half, so 45% think that many jobs will change, requiring substantial reskilling, recruitment or redeployment. And 40% think some jobs will change, but little impact on overall size and profile of the workforce. So I guess people are violently agreeing, perhaps, with, with what you're, you're yeah. saying, um, Dave. Yeah. So I, I think what's um, one of the challenges for HR here, and you talk about um, jobs changing, not so much at the, the jobs disappearing wholesale, but significant changes at the task level. So one of the implications of that, presumably, is that you you know, for HR is that we need to be thinking about how we redesign jobs. Correct. Um, so is, is, that, is that something that, you know, as, as a function we should be focusing on building our I think it's to a, do that? I think it's a capability that we seem to have either forgotten or have decided that we don't want to get involved in it because um, I always look at lots of organisations who go through loads and loads of restructures and most of the reason why they do that is because they got it wrong the first time they restructured. And, and I think that doesn't mean that the business doesn't know what it's doing, but I do think it needs a bit of a guidance around a structure, a methodology that helps you to start to design the organisation around not just outputs, but also inputs from a process task and also importantly from a people. What are the things we want them to do to support that? Because I think learning has got a critical part to play in the future of work because nothing's going to stay the same for very long. And so I, I think, you know, if I'm looking at it, I'm thinking organisational design, job design. We need to get those in our toolkit. We need to be thinking about the scenario planning, which I know we're going to be focusing on in a moment. 
I think we need to be looking at capability frameworks. Most of our competency frameworks were created years ago or took two years to actually get to a point where they were able to be used. They're out of date the day we use them. So I, I think we've got to start thinking that we can't have our old mentality of everything has got to be 100% perfect before we go live with it. I think we've got to be a little bit more courageous and a little bit more, you know, trying to shape and design the future because I think businesses need our support and help. Yeah. Sarah, it would be interesting to hear your perspective um, from Tate and Lyle. So, you know, we've been talking about the potential impact of, of automation and, and technology. How, how is that playing out in, in your industry so far? I think one of the challenges, I think we have to think more broadly and think in terms of culture and also the psychological contract and how people connect because I think, you know, when you automate, especially if you're in a factory and you automate lines, you go from having teams of people working to maybe one person and it can be quite isolating. I mean, you know, I've had instances where suddenly sort of absences become really high and when you go and talk to people, it's because they don't feel they're letting their team down anymore. What are the consequences of them not being there? It's just a machine. So how do you build those connections and really ensure that people stay highly engaged and motivated? Hmm. Okay, so we've had, um, we've had a couple of questions from the audience. Um, going back, actually going back to the, the demographic um, information and also um, thinking about uh, the impact on different industries. So um, we've got one question around the impact of Brexit and, and how much that, that comes into play, but also looking across industries. So do, do, we, do we see um, different levels of impact across different industries potentially? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the simple conclusion about Brexit is that staying quite apolitical <laughs> um, is that if as a consequence of it through either legal regimes or just practical consequence the net migration goes down, it will make this situation more acute. Now, there's a way to respond to that. So I'm not saying that the response needs to be migration. Um, the response can be around some of the untapped labour pools within the UK, some of the uh, productivity and automation enhancements that we can have. But I would say that there's probably going to be some skills in some areas where migration will be part of the, the solution. So, so I almost our conclusion is that Brexit doesn't matter. There's a bigger issue that we need to make sure that we're, that we're covering. Um, I think the industries things is a very interesting point. We did look at it by industry um, in terms of macro industries and by regions. And what we found is that directionally, most industries will probably be impacted. I think the reason we say most and probably is that obviously some industries may have automation hit them in a greater effect. So for them it may not be a numbers perspective, but I think they're still going to be hit by the skills scarcity. So whereas some uh, industries that will require large volumes going further will be hit because they just can't get people, I think even in, in companies where your numbers may decline, you're still going to be struck with the skills scarcity problem. So I, I think all industries will be impacted. Okay, great. So one, one solution, we, we've, we've talked about um, rethinking jobs, which is, which is one option to uh, um, look at the, the, how we deal with the impact of, of technological change. We also, I guess, need to be prepared and need to understand, so organisations, we need to understand the sort of scenarios that we might be facing and, and have some options in, in the bag to prepare for that. So, and um, in, at CRF, we've been talking a lot about workforce planning recently, and we, we find that it's a topic that's really um, come alive in the last five years within the HR function. Um, so that's potentially uh, uh, something that can help us get a better understanding of what sort of um, uh, scenarios we, we might be facing and, and put some plans in place to, uh, to be ready for those different scenarios. Not necessarily one answer that, um, you know, that, that, that sort of ticks all the boxes, but have, have more kind of flexibility and agility built into the, the workforce. Um, so. Julie, I think that the danger when we talk about workforce planning is it can sound like a pretty daunting bureaucratic process and perhaps historically that's what it has been for many organisations and perhaps that's why it went, it went out of fashion for, for a long time. But can you, can you sort of give us some hope in terms of there are ways of doing workforce planning that, that um, will actually help us with that longer term planning and, and decision making without getting bogged down in, in putting together you know, huge spreadsheets that then don't actually help us make better decisions. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're right, workforce planning has been around for a long time and has been adding value for a long term time, so there's lots of hope there. Uh, I think probably 10 years ago, it was used as a very, um, almost an equivalent to budget headcount planning, but people just tried to stretch it out to three to five years. And so that's where we got into this very granular spreadsheet kind of process over outcomes. And um, as a consequence, we lost the business. So a lot of managers, when you go out, they remember this archaic, awful process that added no value. And, and so we have to overcome that. Uh, I think now where we see workforce planning come back is a lot of people are actually using it more as a, a, to get a better understanding of capability. I think we run the risk though of potentially getting too broad. So if we go up too high a level and we just talk about capability and broad concepts, but we don't translate that into meaning, we actually run the risk of going too far the other way. So, so what I think we need to always keep in mind is that what workforce planning is really doing is translating the business strategy into a people strategy. So it, as long as we always keep that end goal into mind and then think in an organisation, what do we need to do in order to get there? Rather than following a process for process sake, we'll, we'll start off in a good place. And different organisations, therefore, should do different things because their business strategy is different <laughs> but um, and, and what they can understand from it will be different. But I think what we're seeing is that people... The, they need to understand it's not about perfectly predicting the future. We need to create that expectation straight away. Um, what it is is about getting a directional understanding of where we're going in terms of our people needs to put in place better people strategies today, knowing that even though the business strategy might change every three to six months, when we think about people strategies that work, building long-term capability, reskilling large parts of the population, creating a better labour pool of candidates, those things take time. So what we're really trying to do is get enough of an understanding of where we may be going in order to make better decisions about that and getting that balance between a couple of long-term initiatives that make sense and also the short-term things that we need to do. And a good outcome of, work, of a workforce plan, it doesn't look like anything. It actually is just your people strategy and it means that your people strategy is better balancing the long-term and the short-term and luckily saying no to some of the short-term things that won't add value, which I think is quite important because a lot of HR communities feel very overwhelmed by the number of initiatives that aren't joined up, that aren't adding value. And so actually this should help even to give you even more motivation. Um, it should actually help to solve that issue as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Okay. So, and I guess a workforce plan is only ever going to be as, as useful as the decisions that it then enables the business to take on the back of exactly. the information that it provides. So um, we're going we're to talk in a minute about the practical application of that. But I thought before we get into that, we have um, be good to get some input from the audience in terms of how effective is workforce planning at driving bu business decisions in, in your organisation. So if we can um, uh, get everyone to respond to the, the next poll. Um, and the options are... Workforce planning is either not at all effective, somewhat effective, neutral, fairly effective, extremely effective, or maybe you don't do workforce planning, and that would be interesting to, to know about as well. So, so we'll, we'll leave you to um, think about the, the answer to that. And, and Sarah, I'd like to uh, talk to you about... Uh, so, uh, Tate and Lyle, you, you've been through this in, in real life and um, been through a number of iterations of, of uh, strategic workforce planning within the business. So can you just share with us the story of, of, um, of, of what you've done and some of the outcomes? Yeah, and I think, you know, I would really build on Julia's point. It, I, I think it's very much around a directional understanding of where we want to be investing and, and the people strategies. So, so I would say, you know, when we started looking at, at strategic workforce planning, I think my initial um, focus was how can we really embed this in an existing business process so it was owned by the business. So we embedded it in the five-year planning process. Um, and, and therefore we had to work really closely with our strategy team and our finance team to drive that through <coughs> and actually the whole process was owned by our business general managers. So the conversation was very much at a business leadership level with HR very much facilitating those conversations uh, and it was really embedded in those, those broader business processes that were already going on. Um, and, and I think the business sponsorship and really ensuring that actually it wasn't an HR activity, it was a, a leadership conversation that the leadership teams had 
um, linked to then the strategy and where they were saying they wanted to grow. And then the next question was, okay, well, if we want to do that, then which are the geographies that we're going to invest in that we need to build capability? What are the capabilities we specifically need? Where is it easy to buy those? Where do we know we have to develop them? And then that broader conversation so we could really identify what some of the tough choices we need to make were. And I think the other really critical thing was you've got to keep it simple. So we said when we started, it would be no more than three to five slides in the, in the five year plan because and even then, you know, work and I worked with finance and the strategy team on actually developing the templates because actually, you know, people often, especially the HR people, weren't sure where to start. And I think if we'd sent them, you know, pages and pages and spreadsheets, I think people would have been really overwhelmed and actually when they really got into the conversation most of them had quite a lot of depth and insight so they could move there quite quickly and actually it was the facilitation of the conversation and getting all, all that information that really helped force those choices and then actually by working with finance you could actually get some numbers associated with some of those choices that needed to be made and actually we did have to have some quite tough conversations about well could we make that investment at that that point what impact would it have on margin and actually, I, I think by doing that, we made some quite long term decisions on building capability over sort of three and five years. And the business really signed up to that because they could see how it was embedded in the broader plan. Mm. And, and looking at um, the capability of the HR function to support this process, did you have to invest in particular skill sets or you, you know, building capability to? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I was surprised that in some ways, um, I think HR people were really good at, at looking at what was going on in their business. They're good business partners. They really understood all that. I think they found it harder to bring the outside in. So the demographics that Julia has been talking about and things like that, I think they found it quite challenging to actually think in that way and to go out and gather that information and really sort of say, in that geography, what's happening in the, the economy, what's the inflation rate, you know, where's the population going to go, what's happening in the universities, what skills are people learning? They found that really difficult. And, and I think, you know, I, I did some work with my team around, um, you know, teaching them how to do pestles and things like that. But actually, I think one of the learnings was we needed to do more of that skills building to make them feel more comfortable in that space. Mm, yeah. And, and I think when we've um, looked at how to create an HR strategy within CRF, one of the conclusions that we always seem to come to is that one of the unique contributions that HR can make is around bringing in that outside perspective, particularly around availability of the workforce, demographic shift. So it really is, you know, if we're talking about how can we create a, a great impact as a function, that's an area where really we, we have a, a unique contribution to make. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it is a process as well. So I think, you know, the first year it, it's a bit bumpy and they're so, com they're so focused on the process that that's where all the energy goes. And then in the second year, I think you just have to accept it just gets better year on year and then they start looking outside more because they've got a basis that they're working from. So I think it's very much an evolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got the results of the poll that have come in. Um, so 43%, um, uh, which is the, the biggest uh, response rate, uh, feel that, that workforce planning is somewhat effective in their organisation. So. Um, and there's only a fifth, 20%, who would say that it's fairly, workforce planning is fairly effective, only 3% extremely effective, and then 11% don't do workforce planning. So clearly this is um, an area where we, there's a lot of potential for, uh, for improvement and, and learning. Okay, so we, we've, um, we've sort of touched on um, the the, uh, the implications of uh, the future of work around capability building um, and um, so there are um, we'd like to sort of talk about the implications for, for what, are, what organizations can do to both um, equip to, to get the organization ready for, for what's needed for the future but also to, to equip individuals to, to learn and, and build new skills and, and upskills upskill and get ready for uh, the sort of jobs that might exist in the future that don't exist today. So, Nick, to, to bring you into the conversation, um, 
we, we're talking a lot about the, the ageing workforce, um, we're going to be retiring much later, we've got this growing um, elderly population that, that someone in the workforce is going to have to fund their pensions. Um, so we're, the chances are we're going to be working much later in life than would historically have been the case. And also with the, the fast pace change in technology and the nature of jobs, we're going to be working in a very different work context as well. So. Clearly, there's lots of implications for um, for for learning how how we can keep up to date the responsibility that organisations have to, to do that. So, can you maybe share some of your work around that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, one of the problems with thinking about trends is that the past is only really a good guide to the future, so long as the future resembles the past. And as we know, generally it doesn't. So I think there's kind of significant disruption ahead. And there will be people who kind of get it and people who don't. And the people who get it will be the winners and the people who don't will, will lose big. So I think I'm in the deeply pessimistic camp, just to kind of introduce a little bit of balance to this conversation. Um, and if you want the kind of expanded rationale behind that, um, Martin Ford's book, The Rise of Robots, gives a really good um, uh, kind of rationale behind um, how this is not going to be anything like the Industrial Revolution. So I think there's, we're being lulled into this false of sense of security, this idea that, you know, oh, the old jobs will go, but there'll be new jobs and we just have to retrain. That is not going to happen. And I think what's going to happen is a dramatic reduction in the number of highly paid, highly skilled jobs. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, let's be honest, organisations are not looking at AI and automation as ways of creating new shiny jobs. They're looking at them as ways of maintaining and improving their competitive advantage in an increasingly kind of challenging kind of marketplace. So what does this mean in terms of kind of capability? Well, I think that what we have to engage in, the winners in this race, are going to be people who are aggressively de-skilling their organizations. That's to say, stripping out any requirement to have kind of capability. What I mean by that is, if you've got people, a more contingent workforce, and, and the workforce trends suggest that there'll be an increasing dependence on contingent labor, you've got people uh, coming in and out of the business doing smaller tasks, as Dave has kind of picked up, what I would describe as this kind of disaggregation of roles. You cannot afford to be pushing more and more conventional training into that model. You cannot have people who take six months to get up to speed. And the only way that you can do that is to reduce your dependence on individual capability and to actually de-skill the organization. Now that may sound counterintuitive, but if we think about a, a model of it, a good model is taxi driving. So some of us are old enough to remember the time when black cab drivers you know, had to have the knowledge. Um, I, I kind of predate uh, uh, GPS or sat-nav. And at that time, you had to employ highly skilled people with a high level of capability to do that job. But then if you introduce a performance guidance system, sat-nav, look at what that does to your resourcing model. Look at what it does to your, your costs um, uh, and to your, kind of your, your, your wages. And look at what it does to the business. Um, Uber isn't in itself disruptive. Uber only exists because SatNav exists. So you see, when you start to introduce performance guidance, you can dramatically shift your, your kind of resourcing model because you can employ people a very low level of capability to do almost any job. So the significance of that is People will sometimes talk to kind of hybrid working as, as uh, you know, the optimists will, the apologists perhaps will say, you know, but there's going to be this wonderful world where we work side by side with the machines. Working side by side with the machines is something that we've already seen in the case of taxi driving. And that has created a slew of really low paid jobs, which where it's a kind of a, an HR wild west um, and which is likely to be shortly replaced by kind of automation. So I think sort of summing up, I think we're going to see a kind of a squeezed middle. So we're going to see lots of, of uh, kind of fragmented, um, disaggregated um, uh, tasks, what some people refer to as kind of the gig economy, or, or David D'Souza refers to as the any gig I can get economy, which I think is probably more accurate. Um, and then we're going to see um, at the top end a very competitive kind of environment for, for highly paid roles. And I'll give you just one example. What might be a good thing for people to be learning now? How about taking a philosophy um, of ethics degree. Because if you're creating automated vehicles or your Facebook tackling face, fake news, you might want a couple of people who've got a background in ethics. But you're not going to want thousands of them. You might want one or two. Even for an enormous company, you might only want a couple. 
So I think that people are going to have to think very carefully about where they want to be in that, in that model, if they want to be racing to the top or if they want to be kind of driven towards the bottom. Right. Yeah, so um, I was reading the other day about uh, lots of the tech companies in Silicon Valley hiring anthropologists, yeah. I think, for, for, that, for that reason, yeah. to get a better understanding of the, the human systems. Um, so you, you gave the example of taxi drivers, which is, is already a, a, a fairly low-skilled um, mm. role that's, that's moving into an even lower-skilled uh, type of role because it's um, all the, the sort of um, the knowledge-based stuff is, is um, supported by technology. Yeah. Are, where else do you envisage looking perhaps higher up the, the, the chain in terms of more knowledge and skills-intensive roles? Where else yeah. do you see that happening in the future that we might not expect that today? So the, the mantra that, that we've sort of been driving is resources, not courses. Um, I think the future will be guidance and performance guidance for every role. So if, if you want to be one of the winners, I think, in this kind of future disruption, you have to about be thinking about kind of sat nav for everything, for every job in your organization. Have you redesigned it in such a way that somebody with very low levels of capability could do it highly proficiently or it could be automated. That's kind of going to be your challenge ahead. And so I think it's an inflection point for learning professionals where historically we thought about building organizational capability by building individual capability. So you know, we want organizational capability, going to put lots of people in classrooms and give them e-learning modules. And, and we've seen that that's largely ineffective as an approach. But I think the inflection point is if we can simplify roles and we can introduce performance guidance systems, whether that's you know, the kind of thing like Alexa that sort of sits on your desk and tells you what the latest update to the HR policy is, or whether it's you know, an app that people use, to enable people to do things, as I say, to a high level of proficiency very rapidly from a very low kind of skill base, that is going to be your way forwards because you're just going to see diminishing returns by trying to train an increasingly volatile workforce and an increasingly volatile environment to do complex things. Um, it's not going to work as a strategy. So as I say, simplifying tasks and building performance support and performance guidance for people so that they can, they can do those higher level jobs really effectively, I think is the way forward. So I think there's a common theme coming out here around uh, the importance of job design. Um, so we were talking about that in the context of rethinking jobs in the light of automation and then potentially um, rethinking jobs uh, by, by, by de-skilling. So in terms of one of the conclusions for, for HR, one of the learnings from, from this is perhaps that um, we need to be thinking about upskilling in, in job design in a way that perhaps we've lost track of that over the last couple of decades in the HR function. Yes, I mean, specifically, I think that's the role that L&D people can take on. When, um, as an L&D person, you really take the time to understand a job and to build performance support or resources, you are effectively writing the algorithm for that job. You're saying, here's a step-by-step -step guide to how to do this job successfully. And, and that's quite different from looking at kind of standard operating procedures, which by and large just kind of sit on SharePoint somewhere and no one ever actually looks at or follows. It, it's about really, you know, cataloguing what it means to do a job. That might be leadership, for example. Um, we, we do a lot of that kind of work, looking at what makes for kind of successful leadership in a way that, that anybody can kind of follow. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. So we've got a question from Mandy. Um, so the question is, what's the middle, and is there a middle class of jobs, or are we, or are we really talking about this holiday middle? No, so uh, I, I don't think there is. <laughs> I don't think it's a gloomy kind of pessimistic <laughs> view. But it, um, I don't think that, in a sense, that's the, that's the point of the squeeze middle. You, you get squeezed in the middle. So I think at the very top there is the you know the anthropologists that you describe. You know, you're not going to have many of those in an organisation, even a big organisation. At the very bottom is automation, and in the middle is this kind of low wage hybrid working, where basically all of the real expertise is devolved to, to a, de a device, to automation, because that's the efficient way to do it. Um, and so I think that's an interim arrangement where you might have kind of hybrid working because it's just not currently cost effective to kind of fully automate it or because there might have to be a human element to, to, to what you do. So, but those human elements are kind of vanishingly small. I'll give me a simple example. Um, if you're looking in, in the educational space, for example, at um, working with students, you can get a computer to mark a multiple choice examination. 
but you cannot and you will not be able to get a computer um, to mark an essay because that requires really understanding what somebody's going to try and communicate. So you might say, oh, well, that's good because then there'll be roles, but the more likely direction is that the bigger educational institutions will look to reduce the proportion of assessment which is done in that fashion. So you, uh, I think you begin to see how that middle is going to get kind of squeezed over time. Mm. Okay, so we, we've got a question from Rami which is um, around uh, how we might have to redesign job architecture. So the question is will, will we fundamentally redesign job architectures as people will do multiple tasks from different jobs? So in, in, if I was giving the example of his, his role is 15% communications, 50% HR um, uh, specialist and 35% and business partner. So potentially you could end up, uh, individuals could end up doing jobs that currently sit across multiple functions. So is that, is that the sort of phenomenon we might be seeing? I think the idea of people having more than one role and, and breaking up their time by percentages is really interesting. Mm. Um, and especially when you don't have scale in organisations, if you've got that intellect and you can use it in different areas, I think that's that we, I, we do try and do that. Mm. And, uh, sorry, Dave. No, I was just going to say, I do know of some pilots of some organisations who remain nameless for the moment, who are actually creating multidisciplinary teams which are basically a little bit like the old empowered teams for those of people who are older like me that can remember those but in actual fact are actually saying we don't need job descriptions we have a team description and once that team activity is finished we go into a pot and then we may well be part of another project activity so I, I, I think the fluidity and therefore the importance that learning has with supporting performance information will become more important because at the moment we're thinking job design, it could be team design, it could be organisational design. I just think the disruptive factors will be looking for the most effective way of doing it from an organisation's perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's up to HR to remain the humanitarians within it, possibly. Yeah. Okay. I think one of the other things that we're seeing uh, when, we, when we talk to the CRF membership is the there's a great deal of interest in agile development mm. methodologies and that started in the software world but we're seeing more and more um, in business operations and in HR you know adopting some of the techniques around agile which you know potentially is we're talking about similar things there as a, as a different way of of um, looking at how we assign work and the roles that people play in the organization. It's very interesting um, uh, I think it's a, a good call to look at how um, the software world is tackling some of these problems um, and as you say Dave that sort of model is already in place in some organizations where th there's just a task marketplace and yep. you're sort of bidding for stuff um, and you can you, you can sort of blur the edges of the organization that way very successfully um, but freelancers.net has been around for quite some time you know you basically just go on there you've got a piece of work to be done and people bid to do that work and then it becomes very important that you maintain your kind of track record so you can see a world where people are earning badges or accomplishments much as they might do for computer games um, and then that becomes an important part of um, who you engage who you hire to do a, a particular task rather than a role um, so I think that will be an increasing feature this earning of accomplishments through through undertaking some of these tasks okay so we're going to just turn quickly to our final poll um, and uh, the question is, to what extent is your learning and development strategy geared up to reskill people whose roles will disappear or change fundamentally as a result of technological change? So while we, we're going to um, take the last minute or so just to uh, think about some practical recommendations and if you can answer that poll while we're thinking about that. So um, just, just to conclude on, on uh, perhaps one key practical takeaway that um, each of our speakers could, could share that uh, perhaps we can share with the audience. So I'll start with you, Julia. Yeah, I think mine would, would definitely focus on, you know, even if your workforce is decreasing overall, there are still going to be really specific skill sets um, and jobs that you need to look to, and it's going to be increasingly harder to, to find people. So my practical takeaway is to really think very differently around kind of untapped talent. And I think the best way to go about that is not to start with diversity necessarily, but actually to start with what are your minimum qualifications for the roles? What are the assumptions we've made on experience or technical qualifications? And really making sure we look back on those. Okay. Uh, for me, 
HR always wants, it always alludes to wanting to be strategic. So I think one of the key ways is we've got to focus on those processes which add the greatest value. And we've also got to make sure that we actually have a, an opinion about what is happening in the outside world. Yeah, I would say really identify um, which capabilities are critical for your competitive advantage that are differentiated and hard to copy and really invest in developing those. So I'm you, Nick. take a, a learner's perspective. So if you're anticipating this future rather than an organisation, um, ensure that your learning is kind of everyday and diverse. So you're learning from lots of different sources to ensure you have that degree of resilience, but also that it becomes a habitual every day. Every day you're learning something new. I think those two things are important. Okay, so I'd like to thank all our panellists and all the audience for, for taking part today. You can continue the conversation on the live webinar feed and also via Twitter using the hashtag CR Forum. And um, the, the webinar will be available to download uh, as a, as a catch-up um, within the next couple of days. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.